Hey gang, Dr. Scott Stevens here. We've been talking about creating graphs, usually with qualitative data so far, about pie charts and bar charts. And we said that those things can also be used with quantitative data, provided that your data doesn't have too many different values. But today we're going to talk about the more frequent case when there are a lot of different values. For example, I'm going to go out and get information on 100 randomly selected US households to look at how much money they bring in over the course of a year. When I did that, here are the numbers that I got, and as you can see, they go down for 100 rows. Most of us aren't very good at looking at a long set of data like this and making anything sensible out of it. What we'd like is to come up with some graphical representation for this. But hopefully you can see what the problem is. I can't really do a bar chart in the sense that we've been used to, with each bar representing one different value, because there are 100 different values on this chart. Now, what we'd like is something more like this which breaks the incomes into various ranges, all the same size, and then tells us how many people fall inside each range. That's what today is about, making this kind of graph, which is called a histogram. What makes it a histogram? Well, first of all, it is a bar chart. Traditionally, we make all the bars right next to each other with a histogram. That's just kind of a convention. But notice that the labels for each category are, in fact, a range of values, and they go in order from smallest up to largest. In order to be able to make a chart like this, there are about three questions you have to be able to answer. The first one is, how big should each category be? The second one, how many categories do I need? And the third one, how many data points really are in each category? Those are the things that we're going to tackle in today's video. So, let's go back to the data and see how we can do it. I'm going to show you a relatively easy way to do this kind of kind of work. Uh, another way that you can do it is to use the spreadsheet that I actually created on the website. You can see one it's called um, Frequency Distributions, Histograms, and Box Plot, and it does a whole bunch of things, including making histograms. So you're welcome to use that for your work. If you do that, you'll be changing the data to say, here's where the first category starts, here's how wide each category is, and it'll fill in the rest. I said start at zero with categories of size 300, so the first is zero to 300, the second 300 to 600, and so on as far as the chart happens to go. Today I'm going to show you a different way using a very useful tool called the pivot table. So let's go back to my data and I'll show you how to do this. The first thing I'm going to want to do is to make sure that the data that I have has a heading for it. It doesn't have to be in cell A1, it could be anywhere on the spreadsheet, but it has to have a heading. Here I've called it income. All right, I'm going to then choose insert from the menu and say insert a pivot table. A pivot table is an extremely useful thing for summarizing all kinds of data, but today I'm only going to use it in one way. Obviously it says here select the table or range, and I'm going to highlight all of this data including the heading. By the way, if you want to know how I did that so fast, I hit control shift down arrow to select the entire data set there. It says, where would you like the pivot table report to be placed? I'll say, let's put it on a new worksheet so we're not distracted by the data that we already have. This will add a new page to our uh, workbook. So I'll say, OK. And here's what I get. Now, if I had more than one column in my table, I'd have more than one label up here. But since I only have one column, I'm only seeing one variable, income. And for what we're doing today, I'm going to grab that and drag it down to the rows label. Now you'll see those values all have all appeared over here on the left hand side. I'm also going to grab that same thing, income, and drag it down into the values area. And at this point you may see different things. Right now it says sum of, which is really not a very useful idea. I actually want to know how many times each one of these values appear. So I can do that right here by saying instead of sum of, I'll choose the little choice and say my value field settings, I'll say I'd like the count instead. Okay. It's not really telling me much different. Here are all the different amounts of income that we have for households and how many times each one came up. You can notice they've been sorted from smallest to largest automatically. They weren't that way on our raw data. This household only made a little over $1,000 in the year, while the last household on the list made about half a million, $562,000. Well, the sensible thing would be to put these into groups, into categories of a given size. How big should that size be? Well, I don't know for sure. Let's get a rough idea by doing a few calculations. In this data set, the smallest value was that number right there, 114,013 cents. This was the smallest. The largest value was at the bottom of the list down here. And as you can see, it's this number here, $562,209. I'll take that value and put that up here for the largest value. It's so big, I have to make the column wider. 
If I subtract these two things, the smallest from the largest, I get what's called the range. And it's the simplest measure of dispersion or spread of the data. Our values from the cheapest, from the, from the poorest person to the richest household, I should say, is $561,000. That's the range of numbers we're going to have to cover with our data. Now, how many categories should we use? Well, one way that you can figure this out is to follow what's quite literally a rule of thumb. What you do is that you stick your thumb up and you say the number 2. And then every time you stick up another finger, you double the number that you say. And you keep on going until you get to about the number of observations that you have. This was one finger, my thumb, for a 2. And I'll keep on going, doubling it to 4, then to 8, then to 16, then 32 then 64, then 128. I have 100 observations, so that's about where I want to stop. And if you notice, I've done 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 numbers. Okay? So I want approximately 7 categories for my data. Okay? Somewhere around there. A little few more or a few less are fine, but I'd like about 7. So let me get rid of this calculation here and put about 7. Okay? Now, if I'm going to have seven categories all the same size, and they're going to cover that range of numbers, then the uh, minimum cat size that I can get away with, the smallest category that will, will cover the entire range, is that range divided by the number of categories I decide that I want, which is a little over 80,000. Okay? Now, I don't want a category size of $80,156, because my first range would, for example, run, run from... Uh, $1,114 up to $1,114 plus $80,156 and so on. Those are ugly numbers. So I'd rather have something a little nicer. Because it's just under 80, 000, just over 80000 I might think, how about trying a category of size 8? That says that every category can be just a little bit bigger than 70000 75000 is a pretty nice number. So I'll use 75000 Now, how did I get that? Well, it was a actually kind of a judgment call. It has to be at least as big as 70,000 to get eight categories. And 75,000 is a number that is a pretty nice round number. And you often want to have those for your categories as well. So I'm thinking about having categories somewhere around the size of 75,000. With that in mind, I can actually use my pivot table and have it create the table for me. Here we go. I'm going to go to my row labels over here and pick any of the row labels that are in here and right click on it. One option I have is group. And so I'm going to say, start my grouping at, well, rather than starting at that weird number of 1114, I'm going to start my grouping at 0. It'll end at the biggest number, but I'm going to count by 75,000. OK. When I do that, I'll get this table telling me how many people fall into each one of these categories. Note, by the way, my calculations over here got screwed up because these numbers are now different than they used to be. I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 categories, which sounds great. And if you notice, um, but if you notice, there's some that are missing over here. This one goes from 0 up to, but not including 75,000. This one from 75,000 up to, but not including 150,000. And all the way down, but this one, 225, 225, 300, 300. Fantastic. 375, 375, 450, and 525. Notice that there's a gap in here of a missing category. So let me go ahead and fix that if I'm going to make a graph of this stuff. I'll grab all this data here copy it, and I'll paste it over here where it's a little easier to do some work with it. Control V will do a paste. My categories look okay, except before that last category, I need some more rows. This one here, for example, they all have zero in them, however many I need. This one should start at 450,000 and should go up by 75,000 to 525,000. And that's actually the only thing that's missing. I was only missing one category. So let me get rid of those extra zeros. Let me get this. And now I'm going to create a histogram, which really is going to be nothing more than a bar chart. And you know how to do that. Highlight the headings, also highlight the numbers. And now we'll say um, insert bar chart. I'm going to keep it simple like that. And there's my chart. I can give it a nice name. We already showed you how to do that, so I'm not going to do it in this video. I did tell you that we do like the bars to be right up against each other. So let me show you how to do that. Left click then right click on the series and say format data series. See this thing that says gap width? You want it to be darn close to zero. I usually like it to be a little bit so you can see the bars separated from each other by just a touch, like 2%. Don't worry about series overlap with only one picture. So 
Here's a histogram. I could make the axis point in a little better direction to make it look nicer. Format axis. I'll go over here to alignment and say, let's make the text direction run vertical. Okay. And as I said, I could put in a nice title. I might want to indicate what the horizontal axis is actually measuring. I could do that by clicking on the graph, going up here to design if it's not already selected, then add chart element, axis title, primary horizontal axis, and I can say this is household income, uh, and it's measured in dollars. Okay, something like that. So here I have a graph that's pretty good, and I can see more or less what's going on. I first see that the population is skewed to the right. That is, there's a long tail on the right. There's a whole bunch of people who don't make all that much money, and then there's a few people who make a whole bunch. We'll be talking more about skew a little later. But I can see here that out of my 100 people, somewhere around 63 of them, 64 as you can see from the graph, actually made between zero and $75,000 a year. That's about 63% of my population. Then we had about 19 people out of the 100, 19% of who I saw, making between 75000 and 150000 and so on for each of the categories, where I have one person making quite a lot of money out here at over half a million dollars. These are actual figures from real people, and so this gives you an idea of how wealth is distributed, and sorry, income is distributed among households in the U.S. Um, is it more or is it less skewed than what you might have expected? Anyway, that's a way that you can create a, um, a histogram fairly easily. And notice that I could always go back, if I didn't like my graph, I could go back into the data here and change my group size. I could say, ungroup this, and instead let's group it in groups of, let's say, oh, $50,000. Starting at zero, up by groups of $50,000. And I'll end up with more groups. Nine different bars will appear here. Notice that I haven't created the graph for that here. Nine different groups will appear here. Um, I get a finer um, set of data. I'll get more categories. But sometimes the categories get too small to be useful that way. In this case, this would still be fine. Uh, the rules that we used about that powers of two, doubling your number each time, gives you a good idea of approximately how many categories you want, but the exact form depends again on what your data looks like. You'll always want to look at your final graph and see what you think. Okay, that's it for histograms. Go play with some.